Uh, well, hi everyone. Good afternoon um, or good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you happen to be joining us from. My name is Caitlin Tucker. I am the program manager for Rodale Institute's organic consulting team. Um, and I am joining you all from New York, where it is technically spring, even though it still feels and looks like winter outside. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you all today about crop scouting and why this is an essential tool for pest management, not only on organic farms, really all farms, um, all farms of every scale. And uh, just a quick bit about me. Um, I don't have a separate slide for this. So uh, I am an agronomist by training and um, an entomologist. Uh, and have spent a large chunk of my career over the last decade on farms, um, in crop canopies, observing and scouting uh, and diagnosing and educating growers on um, pest management. So today we're going to spend the next hour or so learning about some fundamentals of scouting and I'll be sharing some best practices with you and resources. Uh, but just keep in mind that uh, well, we only have an hour together. And there's a lot more that I could share with you. There's a lot more we could talk about. So uh, I'll be providing some resources. And hopefully that will, will help you all um, continue your education. Um, and uh, if you ever have any questions, follow-up questions, um, I'll have my contact information at the end so we can continue the conversation. Um, before we get started though, I do want to share a few notes on how we'll be conducting this webinar. So firstly, please do check that you can hear me. Um, if not, you may need to check your audio settings. And if you do have any issues, um, I believe Justin will be putting his contact information in the chat uh, so that you can reach out to him. We will be leaving Q&A for the end, um, and you may use the Q&A button on your screen to ask questions, but please do not use the chat itself for questions. We don't want to get those questions um, lost in, in all of the other chat that's happening. And uh, finally, I'll just add that this webinar will be recorded and posted to our website and uh, YouTube channel, hopefully within a week or so. Um, so if you, if you want to come back and, and watch this again, or you weren't able to join us live, it will be available to you uh, fairly shortly after we um, close for the day. I want to share a quick note about our consulting program before I jump into the actual content, um, because I, 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 this is what I do for a living, and I get to work for an amazing, passionate group of agronomists and advocates and educators. And uh, I just want to share more about what we do. So Rodale Institute's Organic Consulting Program was um, launched back in 2019 with support from the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, in order to start providing technical assistance to farmers on transitioning to organic production. And originally we were focused um, just on producers in PA, but we have since grown in just a few short years uh, to having a national presence. So we have a team of 13 consultants, um, including a market coordinator that serve farmers and supply chain actors in their respective regions. And we work with folks wherever they are at in their journey to organic. Uh, and we do so by providing agronomic support, um, including support on crop rotations, um, fertility recommendations, pest, disease, weed management. And we also provide guidance on the National Organic Program requirements, um, assistance on completing organic system plans, preparing for inspections, that sort of thing. And um, our market coordinator plays a critical role in helping connect all of the supply chain dots that ensure um, organic food is, is getting to all of the markets and consumers that are interested in it. So I'd be happy to talk more about what we do in the Q&A um, or after the session, but we're going to jump in to, uh, to talking about bugs, uh, insects, um, 
I want to first start with some definitions just to kind of center this presentation a little bit. As starting with what is a pest, um, this is fairly subjective, uh, of course, but generally we're referring to any organism that causes harm to crops, um, non-crop plants, people, animals. Uh, but keep in mind that insects, uh, both good and bad, friend and foe, they're all a natural part of our agroecosystems. Even pests, um, even though they're feeding and damaging our crops, they serve as an important food source for beneficial insects, for birds, for other wildlife. Um, and at different life stages, they might be providing other ecosystem services like pollination. So in general, um, it's it, I think insects get a bad rap, um, but it's important to remember that only 1% of species are actually pests. Uh, and so with all of this in mind, when we approach pest management in our gardens, on our farms, we are not looking to eliminate every pest in the environment. Not only is that not feasible, but to try and, and achieve that would really involve some very environmentally unfriendly practices that we, we don't want to see on the farms. Um, no, our goal is rather to keep pest populations below damaging levels. And that is how scouting, or, um, and, or rather scouting plays a, a really important part in making that happen. So the other definition I want to introduce up front is integrated pest management, often referred to simply as IPM. And this is defined as a sustainable approach to managing pests, whether they be animals, insects, diseases, weeds. And the approach is integrated because it involves using many different tools in our toolbox. So these tools, they may be cultural tools, um, like planting resistant varieties, intercropping, rotating crops. Um, they are physical tools like uh, hand removal, using traps, um, row cover, biological tools, um, releasing the uh, beneficial insects, um, aka natural enemies or other beneficial organisms. And chemical tools are, are also in that toolbox. There is a time and, and sometimes a place where chemical tools are necessary. So here we're talking about insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and so on. But although they are um, an important option for us when it comes to pest management, they should be used sparingly. And we should be opting for more selective controls uh, over broad spectrum. And we should be using them really only when thresholds dictate management. And I will, I'll, we'll have a couple of slides on thresholds here very soon. So what does the National Organic Program say about IPM? Um, this is a very text heavy slide. So only focus on the yellow highlighted text. Um, in short, organic growers are required to use cultural, physical, mechanical practices um, and biological practices to prevent pests. And only when these practices are insufficient in controlling pests are growers allowed to come in and use approved chemical controls. So basically, IPM. Um, IPM is required for organic production without IPM being explicitly mentioned in the rule. Scouting is really just the routine observation of our crops. And the way it factors into IPM is as a fundamental tool and practice for informing our management. So in order to make financially sound, um, environmentally friendly, effective pest management decisions, we really need to know the types of pests we have on our crops. We need to know how severe the problems are. Um, and the best way to know these things is to get out in the field and observe, you know, to scout. Um, and as a result, we, we get a lot of benefits from this practice. Uh, first and foremost, we're able to stay on top of these pest disease, fertility issues, animal intrusion, if we're concerned about food safety, all of these issues that go on to impact crop yield, 
quality, and ultimately marketability. We want to catch these things early on in the season so that we can do something about them ASAP. Um, so scouting allows us to make very timely decisions. And if we are using chemical controls uh, and we are using thresholds to guide us in those applications, we can effectively reduce the number, the cost, and the environmental impact of, of chemical applications. Um, so let's get into some fundamentals and um, best practices. When is an insect a problem? So there are a few things that can inform us whether we need to be concerned about bugs on our crops. Um, some of these things are, is the bug on our crop an actual known pest? Like, is it a pest or is it just, you know, a, a, a bug passing by it just happens to land on your potato patch or in your cucumbers, but it's not actually causing any harm. If the insect is a pest, are the crop or are the plants receiving a lot of damage? Um, is the damage extensive? We want to think about um, how close the crop is to maturing, or, or rather, just in general, at what stage of growth it's at. Young plants are going to be much more susceptible to um, insect damage than those that are further along in their development. And if they are very close to maturing and you're getting ready to harvest, um, the, the pests that you see out in the field may not be a concern for you at that point in the season. Um, I want to caution you that all of this can be very highly subjective. Uh, if you are a high value, um, or if you are growing high value crops, uh, and your customers cannot tolerate pest damage of any type <laughs> on leaves or fruits, you may have a very low tolerance for the number of pests out in your field. Um, the other thing to, you know, to have caution um, with is that not all pests actually cause economic damage. And, um, you know, a lot of plants can actually be quite resilient and tolerate um, some level of foliar feeding. And one example that I'll share with you is uh, the three-lined potato beetle. So that's this um, beautiful little beetle here in the middle of the screen. It is considered a pest of solanaceous crops, of, of nightshades like tomatoes and potatoes, uh, eggplant, tomatillos. Um, but rarely, <laughs> if not never, have I seen a uh, three-lined potato beetle be an issue on most of these crops. They do prefer tomatillos, but even in large numbers, um, and, and even when there's lots of feeding happen, they're usually not a problem. They're not going to cause a significant amount of damage or yield loss on that crop. And so we just want to, to make informed decisions about pests on the, on the farm so that we can avoid um, you know, misusing our, our time and our labor and our resources to try to treat a problem that really wasn't ever going to be a problem in the first place. And this is where economic thresholds or action thresholds can be helpful. And I know you're probably thinking, Caitlin, I didn't sign up for Entomology 101. Um, and I, I understand, but um, thresholds and scouting go together like peanut butter and jelly. We've got to talk about thresholds if we're going to talk about scouting. So I'll try to keep this pretty simple because it is an important concept um, to understand with regards to pest management. And we're just going to use this graph here in the, the bottom left to kind of illustrate this. So this black squiggly line, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the black squiggly line will represent a pest population over a period of time. In this example, we'll say it's spotted cucumber beetle. It's the population of spotted cucumber beetle over the course of a season. And research has shown us that when the population of cucumber beetles is above six, we'll say six, six beetles per plant, there is risk of the cucumber beetles causing economic damage to that crop, meaning we're gonna lose money. They're either going to kill the plant, um, they're going to feed on enough fruit and flowers to reduce yield or quality. Um, 
they might spread bacterial wilt, um, what, however, however they're impacting the plant. At six beetles per plant, that is the economic injury level. And that's, that's this orange line here. We don't want the beetles to get to that level. So researchers have established um, a threshold, an action threshold of five beetles per plant. So at five beetles per plant, that is when you need to take action and do something. Most commonly, this means spraying a, a pesticide because that's historically where, why economic thresholds were, um, were created. And at five beetles per plant, you know, come in, spray your pesticide only then to help knock the population back down. And so that is the, that yellow line is the economic threshold or the action threshold. So let's say throughout the season, the, the cucumber beetle population is, you know, going up and down like insect populations do. And we start to reach five beetles per plant. We know that because we're scouting. At five beetles per plant, we know to come in and spray, knock that population back down. But the population rebounds throughout the season for any number of reasons. And again, because we're scouting, when we, we reach five beetles per plant, we know to spray again. Further along in the season, for whatever reason, um, we, we missed um, an opportunity to spray. Maybe we had a gap in our scouting. Maybe there was um, an equipment <laughs> failure that took priority over, over scouting. Any number of things happened on the farm. But we missed that opportunity to spray at five beetles per plant. And now the population is high enough that we are actually getting economic damage on that crop. So this is how thresholds kind of factor into the decision making here. What happens if you spray before that economic threshold reaches five? Let's say you, you want to spray at three, at four beetles per plant. Well, really, it's not it's not worth it. The, at the cost of that pesticide application is actually going to outweigh the pest control benefit you're receiving. So that, that is why economic thresholds were developed. And they do exist for a number of major pests on various crops. And to, to share with you some examples, in the Northwest, um, cabbage seed pod weevil is a significant pest of, of canola. And the threshold that's been established um, for this pest and this crop is three to four. If you find three to four cabbage pod seed weevils per uh, 10 sweeps, that's with a sweep of a net, um, then you should take action, right? For something like pepper maggot, which um, is a, a pest of, of, of peppers, um, the a threshold might be as soon as flies are caught on sticky traps, then you should take action. They are going to vary from pest to pest and, and crop to crop. So I'm not going to share specific thresholds with you. Even the cucumber beetle example is just a, a made up example. Um, the important thing here to, to note is that the only way to know whether that pest has reached the action threshold is to actually be out in the field regularly scouting. Um, I would encourage you to reach out um, um, to your local university extension to see uh, if they have created any fact sheets or documents about thresholds for the pests and, and crops in your region. As helpful and um, important as thresholds are, please keep in mind that there are some limitations. They are not available for every crop pest combination, and they are also not suitable for guiding um, other management practices like releasing beneficial insects. Thresholds, like I mentioned, they're primarily used to guide um, sprays, pesticide sprays, fungicide sprays, um, and they, do indeed help significantly to reduce the number of sprays and in turn the cost and labor and, and environmental impact. Um, but the main reason they, they aren't used to guide like with the release of beneficial insects is that chemical sprays are more or less immediately effective, whereas biological controls, you know, lady beetles, predatory thrips, 
they're not as immediately effective. Um, and thresholds are also quite limited in that uh, there might be situations where you have multiple pests feeding on a crop, say flea beetles and Colorado potato beetles, both feeding on your potatoes. Um, to my knowledge, there's not a threshold that um, addresses that specific combination of pests. And then they're also not suitable for ornamental crops. Um, if you are growing ornamentals, your personal threshold for pests may be zero. Your customers may not tolerate any pest damage on, um, on those crops. And um, simply because you're selling them for their aesthetics and any amount of uh, pest damage could hurt that aesthetic value. So that's insect pests. When should we um, be worried or concerned about crop diseases? So this is where the lovely plant disease triangle comes in. And in short, for crop disease to occur, three things need to happen. Three things need to be present. One, you have to have a susceptible crop. Two, you have to have the pathogen <laughs> that causes the disease to be present. And three, you have to have a favorable environment. So um, I'll use cucurbit downy mildew as the example here. On the right, you can see what cucurbit downy mildew looks like on uh, cucumbers. If you are growing a susceptible cucumber variety and the weather is favorable for downy mildew development, um, so that means high humidity, moisture, cooler temperatures, but the actual pathogen has not made its way to your region, it's not present on your farm, uh, you're not going to get downy mildew infection on that crop. Similarly, if you have a favorable environment and the pathogen is present, but let's say you're growing a cucumber downy mildew resistant variety, it's likely that downy mildew is either not going to develop or um, in, in most likely you will have some development, but the crop will have some level of tolerance or resistance to it. And thresholds for disease, um, they do exist. They're slightly different compared to those for insect pests. We use two different um, measurements typically to inform when sprays should occur. Uh, and those measurements are incidence and severity. And so incidence refers to the number of um, or, or percentage of plants that are visibly damaged or have symptoms. And so just quickly, if you had 10 plants, if you randomly looked at 10 plants and four of them had symptoms of a disease, the incidence would be 40%. Severity, uh, uh, actually, it refers to the uh, measurement of how severe the symptoms are. And that's also usually measured as a percentage um, or on other scales. In my past life, I managed a winter wheat screening program for a fusarium head blight, which is a significant disease of cereal crops. And we were intentionally infecting uh, varieties with this disease to see how resistant they were. Um, and what we would do every spring is for each plot, we would go out and randomly select 10 heads of wheat um, to measure incidence. And then um, for each of those heads of wheat, we would also measure severity by counting up the number of infected spikelets. Uh, we also could have used this visual scale that was um, developed for this disease and this particular crop. So when you look uh, for thresholds for crop diseases, you'll see that they vary quite a bit um, depending on the disease and the crop that um, we're talking about. Some action thresholds um, may be if you find septoria leaf spot symptoms on one leaf out of 25 to 50 that you sample, uh, it's time to spray. If 25% uh, of carrot leaves are infected with alternaria, spray. Some crops don't have thresholds for certain diseases like tomatoes and um, bacterial soft rot. Others are less 
thresholds and more just general guidelines based on knowing when a uh, knowing the biology of a disease and when the crop is most vulnerable, as is in the case of white mold on beans. Um, uh, growers are encouraged to to spray um, to begin preventative sprays at time of early bloom because that's when the disease actually infects the crop. So getting into some best practices, uh, when should you start scouting and how often should you be out in the field? In general, I would recommend starting as soon as plants are in the ground. Um, and scouting on a weekly basis, I would say is optimal, but I realize that's not feasible for every operation. Um, in some instances, daily scouting may be needed if you are growing in environments like high tunnels or greenhouses where you have just a really nice, consistent, um, you know, favorable environment for pest development. Uh, pest populations can get quickly out of hand in those environments. So you might need to be scouting more frequently. Um, but as you're developing a, a scouting schedule, I would say keep some other things in mind. Um, the first of all, your, your time and, and labor and resources, keep that in mind because that um, definitely affects how often you're able to get out into the field. But also consider the crop stage. So um, seedlings, young plants, they are going to be more susceptible um, to um, heavy pest pressure or disease pressure. So you might put emphasis on, on scouting um, more frequently in the beginning part of the season. Uh, conversely, if a crop is starting to mature, you might start scouting every other week. Uh, if you're really further along in the season and conditions aren't favorable for pests or disease development, you may decide to stop scouting um, entirely for that crop for the season. And you should also consider um, cropping history. If you know you have a historical pest or disease issue, uh, you may choose to prioritize scouting um, certain crops over others. It's really, you know, I, I, I think it's um, very individual, um, individualized the way that you decide to, to scout on your farm and how frequently. And um, so I, I think it's just good to follow some general guidelines and to assess the resources and time that you have available to you in making those um, decisions. There are a number of ways you can approach scouting. Um, and each has its own pros and cons. I am going to share some of the most common uh, ways of monitoring for pests. Um, it's 2023 and we can get really technologically advanced here with scouting and pest monitoring. I won't dig into that today with all of the apps and um, field-based technology that you can use, but uh, visual observation, um, you know, getting out and walking your fields is probably the most common because it doesn't require a lot of resources. I personally like to walk fields myself because um, it allows me to see other issues that may be popping up in the field. Um, so not only pests and disease, but are there fertility issues? Is there animal intrusion? Are there irrigation problems? Um, and it allows me to do a, a closer inspection. So often the first sign of a pest problem is damage to the crop, um, but not all damage is readily apparent at just you know a quick glance. And um, an example I can share with you is, is up in the top right. This is a, a, a bell pepper that has a few ova position stings. These, I don't know if you can see these little teeny dots here. Those are really scars from the pepper maggot um, inserting its eggs into the bell pepper. And you would never know that those scars were there. You might not know that you have a pepper maggot issue until you're selling peppers and your customers come back to you and say that they have maggots in their peppers or um, some start to rot and you see maggots in, in the peppers. Um, and so it can be helpful to, to actually be out in the field and, and observe things up close. Um, this, of course, can be quite time intensive. 
uh, especially if you have a large farm, you may not be able to walk all of your fields um, and you may ha have to hire a crop scout uh, to walk your fields. And of course it can be kind of complex for highly diversified farms because you know, you're gonna have a lot of different crops that you're growing um, and any number of pests and diseases for every one of those crops. So this is again, where it's important for individual um, producers to, to make decisions on scouting frequency and timing and which crops that they prioritize. Maybe it's the ones that are very high value that they prioritize more intense up close um, inspection of. If you are walking your fields, um, you should know that you don't and shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't look at every single plant or section of the field. You do, however, want a representative um, view of, of the field. You want a representative number of plants and you want it to be random. You don't want just to, to navigate to a problem spot that you know is a problem spot and you want to be as objective as possible. So this can be achieved by following um, any number of patterns um, as you walk the fields. Uh, a W-shaped pattern is really great if your fields are quite long, um, but you can use a, a diamond-shaped pattern or a Z-shaped pattern. Uh, if you are trying to also stay on top of like animal intrusion or pests that may be moving in from neighboring fields, a a uh, quick walk around the perimeter can also be helpful. And um, some folks like to lean on sticky cards for monitoring pests in combination with walking the fields, in combination with um, pheromone lures, which I'll mention in the next slide. These are mostly helpful for flying insects. And uh, different colored cards can be used to attract different pests. So yellow and blue are the most common colors available. Uh, blue is particularly attractive to thrips. Uh, if you know you've got a problem with thrips, you might try to use sticky cards uh, to monitor, um, but they can be used, uh, uh, they're actually really suitable uh, for use in greenhouses and high tunnels, more so I would say than field-based growing. Uh, keep in mind that they are not species specific um, so this yellow card on the left here is, is one that I put up in my exam, uh, in my garden to, uh, to be able to share this example in presentations, uh, but I put it up to attract cucumber beetles. And you can see that there are maybe, I don't know, a dozen cucumber beetles on this trap, but I've also trapped and killed many, many other insects. Um, some of these may also be pests, some may be neutral, some may be beneficial, um, the, the sticky cards don't really discriminate. If it flies into the sticky card, it's, it's going to get trapped. Um, it can also be difficult to actually count uh, pest numbers on these cards because the stickiness can damage insects' um, fragile bodies. And um, to share a very highly specific example, um, on the right is a photo of Swede Midge. It's a fly, um, a teeny tiny, incredibly teeny tiny fly on a sticky card. And uh, fun fact, the, uh, <laughs> the best way to distinguish Swede Midge from other tiny flying midges is to um, take a close inspection of their antennae and to count, you can't really see the little bumps here, but to count these little bumps on their antennae. And, um, Unfortunately, because uh, insects are fragile and antennae even more so, uh, it, it was very difficult to be able to not only ID, but then to count the number of Swede midge that I was looking for because there were antennae all over the place. Um, but they are a useful tool. Pheromone trapping is another approach. This is, I would say, best used for large-scale monitoring. Uh, so row crops, orchards, uh, vineyards, those types of settings. And um, what's really helpful here is that pheromones are going to be species specific. So you don't, you don't have to worry about trapping or killing off target insects. And um, in order to uh, actually count, not just attract, but count the number of 
uh, a particular type of pest. They're used in combination with sticky cards um, or bags or funnel traps. Um, again, these this setup is also best used for flying pests. And um, it can be costly um, depending on the, the size of your operation, uh, the cost of the, the lures themselves, but also factoring in that they do need to be replaced regularly in order to keep that, that pheromone um, present in the field and continuing to uh, attract um, those types of pests. If you are scouting in high tunnels or greenhouses, a few quick notes. Um, in my experience, uh, it's really great to focus on points of entry and uh, sidewalls, or if you have large tears in plastic or like around vents, um, this is likely where pests are going to be moving into those environments. Um, I've also found that uh, plants near heaters and wood burning stoves often experience abiotic damage from the heat or the fumes. Um, so keep this in mind as you're scouting those environments, the damage you are seeing if it's, um, or symptoms you're seeing, if it's around the, the heaters, uh, it might not be um, pests or disease damage that you're seeing, but a, a result of the, the heat. Uh, hanging baskets, very convenient to put our hanging baskets up in tunnels above our other crops. But uh, these flowers can also harbor pests and diseases that can move into your uh, crop below. So they should also be scouted um, as well. And then some areas that I, uh, I, I think can be easily missed, um, crops under row cover. It is really easy for crops um, under any type of fabric to, to be kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and if you're not uh, rotating crops um, effectively, or if the fabric has holes or tears in it, pests can enter <laughs> or be present and they can quickly get out of control. I know it's very inconvenient to have to move, um, you know, the, the weights or however you're, you're weighing down the, um, the fabric in order to take a peek under the row cover. But it's really crucial that you, you scout those um, areas as well. Weeds, I am not recommending that you scout your weeds uh, for pests or disease, um, but just be aware that some insects or diseases can easily move from suitable weedy hosts to cash crops. Uh, same with cover crops. Um, and be sure to look in whorls and stems. These are great places for pests to hide and I think can easily be overlooked. If there's if you um, take anything from this particular slide, look under the leaves, flip them over, please do it for me. Um, it's often not enough to walk your field and, and look for pests and disease just you know on top of the canopy. A lot of pests like to lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves. Um, some diseases can be more easily identified by flipping over the leaf and uh, looking for symptoms on the underside. And uh, a quick example for this, on the top right of the screen, we have a tomato leaf showing some yellowing um, on the top side that could easily, uh, at first glance, be, um, be considered a, a possible fertility issue. But if you flip the leaf over, you'll find this nice, brown velvety leaf mold. And so now you know, okay, this is a this is a, a disease issue. It's not a fertility issue. And biosecurity. Uh, I don't want to um, overlook this because it's really important uh, whether you are um, visiting a farm, having someone visit your farm, it's a good idea to um, establish some level of biosecurity protocols. Uh, to reduce the chance or just prevent entirely diseases or pests being um, introduced from one area to another, either by employees um, on the farm or, or visitors to the farm. It could be an extension agent. It could be a crop scout. It could be a consultant. Um, 
So if you do not have some sort of biosecurity protocol, it could be a sign-in sheet. You could, um, you know, there might be situations where PPE, personal protective equipment, would be necessary. Uh, you might ask that employees or, or visitors stay out of certain areas. Um, another tip would be to scout enclosed environments first. So greenhouses, high tunnels. Again, pest populations can get uh, out of hand pretty quickly in these environments. And so we don't want to introduce anything, any hitchhikers that may be coming with us from the fields into those enclosed environments. So we want to scout um, those areas first. Uh, save, um, save farms or fields with known issues for last. If you know you have a recurring or historical issue with uh, a disease or pest, um, scout those areas last. And again, reduce the chance of introducing any um, pathogens or insects to areas that don't have that um, problem just yet. And then uh, it can also be helpful, this especially if you're visiting farms um, uh, to, to scout, uh, but it can be helpful to have boot covers, uh, alcohol spray for disinfecting, um, hand tools or equipment that you might use, uh, hand wipes. And uh, just be aware of hitchhiking insects in general, um, not just those crop pests, but other invasive species. Um, spotted lanternfly is, you know, just a, a very pretty uh, uh, big example, I think, that is, is well known, at least in the Northeast, um, just being cognizant of how it can easily hitchhike on, on equipment, vehicles, and um, trying to reduce the movement um, of that pest by having biosecurity protocols in place. Scouting observations should also be recorded. Uh, at minimum, you should be tracking dates, uh, field or tunnel IDs, crops, and there's the stage of growth. Um, observations like the uh, pest type and number, uh, plant damage ratings, you know, severity incidents, um, natural enemy type and number. It can also be helpful to make notes about the types of management practices that you used in order to assess whether they were actually effective or not. And uh, there are just, there are so many <laughs> scouting like forms and templates available. You don't need to create your, your own from scratch. Um, I would encourage you to, to seek out what's available um, uh, from university extension and then see if you can can or, or need to modify the templates just a little bit to, to suit your farm's particular needs. And then the last best practice, uh, if you will, that I want to stress is the importance of accurate identification. <laughs> um, the reason for this is very obviously, we, we don't want to risk letting a pest population go unchecked. Um, if we don't recognize it as a pest. And conversely, we risk harming um, natural enemy populations if we are confusing them for pests. And uh, to make just all of this so much more interesting, a lot of natural enemies do have lookalikes. And I just wanna briefly share a few examples with you. These are various coccinellid beetles that you may see on the farm. And, uh, they are not all friends. Um, if we were having this presentation in person or if we had more time, I would, I would put the question out to you all to, uh, to see which of these you think are, are friends. Um, but since we are low on time, these uh, coccinellids, um, we, we may easily recognize the one in the bottom left, the multicolored Asian lady beetle. But um, two things, lady beetles come in various shapes, sizes, and colors. The twice stabbed lady beetle, eye spotted lady beetle, checker spot, pink spotted, they're all lady beetles. They're all beneficial. They're all providing pest control on the farm by eating aphids and thrips and other tiny pests. But the Mexican be 
bean beetle in the top left, um, which does look very similar to a lady beetle, uh, is actually a pest of uh, many leguminous crops. And then another quick example, these are all stink bugs, but they are not all bad. So the top two um, are, are actually plant feeders, the twice stabbed stink bug and the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, we do not want to see these on our crops. But the bottom two, the spined soldier bug and the two spotted stink bug are actually beneficials. And, um, and the two spotted stink bug in particular is an excellent predator of the Colorado potato beetle. And I specifically wanna call your attention to the spined soldier bug and the brown marmorated stink bug, because you can see at first glance, they look very similar. And the only, I, I think, best way to distinguish them um, from one another is by looking at their, their shoulders. So the spined soldier bug has um, more of a point, you can see here on its shoulders, whereas the brown marmorated, it's hard to see here, but it, it's rounded. Um, this requires you to, you know, close inspection. And so if you're seeing stink bugs on your crop, you might just um, not make an immediate judgment, but take a closer look and confirm whether you are seeing a beneficial or um, a pest. It's equally important to understand the life cycles of not only pests, but natural enemies, because they look different at different life stages. And um, they are also active at different times of the day. Some are, um, you know, you might have a pest problem, but the pest might not be active during the day when you are actually out scouting. Uh, it can also be helpful to know where they overwinter, how they overwinter, um, because that can help inform your scouting. Um, how long do they take to develop? How many generations per year? Again, these are all things, you know, it's, they're nice to know things um, if you are a bug nerd like me, um, you wanna know these things. But um, I realize that it's not feasible for everyone to know how many generations per year um, exist for braconid wasps or Colorado potato beetles. But um, to share some examples of why, uh, understanding life cycles is so important, these are all beneficial insects at one life stage or another. Some of these you may recognize, others you may not. So in the top left, we have um, an oothica, an egg case for praying mantis. In the middle, we have lacewing eggs, these fine little filamentous eggs on, you know, tiny little green egg on a stalk. Bottom left, lady beetle larvae. Uh, in the middle, this is a parasitized hornworm. So the little white eggs here are actually eggs of a braconid wasp. And um, on the right here, this little orange blob is an aphid midge. And it's a very cool natural enemy. It actually uh, latches onto aphids and paralyzes them and sucks out their insides. Um, very cool stuff, in my opinion. But they all, you might you might see all of these creatures and in that life stage or in another. So praying mantis is an adult, lacewing as an adult. We have lady beetle pupa here. And of course, lady beetles as the adult that I think a lot of us easily recognize. The parasitized hornworm. So this is actually the wasp that would would it causes that parasitism. It's very small. Um, and then the aphid midge as an adult. That is not to scale. I assure you, it is much smaller than that. Um, but just important to know. Um, how are we doing on time, Justin? Could you quickly let me know? I can't see my clock. Two fifty. 250. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, we're going to skip this section. Um, we have time, we can come back. I, I would have loved to share some examples with you on how you can rule out other issues and, and distinguish between pest and disease 
issues from like abiotic issues like herbicide damage, um, uh, fertility issues, but I don't think we'll have time for that. So stand by while I flip through these slides. Um, actually, I will go over this. So a really important resource for you all to, to, to know and be aware of, there are a lot of diagnostic labs at universities. Um, so if you have a pest issue or a disease issue or fertility issue, it, there's a good chance that you may be able to um, submit a sample or a photo and they can help you out with diagnostics. Um, some tips, if you are going to take a photo, do take uh, photos from um, multiple angles. And um, close-ups are great. I, I love macro shots of insects, but the big picture is, is really important for um, diagnosticians. They need to know what crop is the insect feeding on? What part of the plant is it feeding on? What does the damage itself look like? How extensive is it across the field? So multiple photos are gonna help out with that. And um, you might consider actually, if, since insects are, are, they move quite quickly in the field, uh, it might be better to actually collect that insect and then try to photograph it in better conditions if it's, um, you know, unfavorable weather outside, or if you're concerned about the insect moving before you're able to take a really good photo. I have seen many a blurry insect photo and can tell you that it, it can be difficult to diagnose um, without uh, just high quality um, photos. This is a nice um, example of, of something you could send in. So we've got um, a close up of leaves here of not only the individual leaf, but a whole plant itself. I'm able to see that there's some twisting of the, the plant, some discoloration, some stunting. But then um, I have other shots here, which help me to understand the incidence and severity of this issue. So I can see throughout this field that there are multiple plants um, with these symptoms. And then if you're going to um, submit an actual plant sample for diagnostics, please do check with that lab uh, first for instructions on how to submit those samples. Um, they you know, do not want dead material. So uh, you do wanna make sure that you get um, a good quality sample and it's shipped to them as, as quickly as you can. And um, Clear labeling, make sure um, you've got the, the location, the date, your contact information, and a description of the problem and severity are, are all very helpful because I, I can't emphasize enough how important context is for actually diagnosing um, crop problems. And then quickly, some resources I want to share with you. When you're out scouting, um, things like field map, uh, cell phone, camera for photos. Uh, if you have um, a macro lens, uh, that can be great for close-up photos of really teeny tiny um, insects um, or you know mites. Uh, a hand lens or a jeweler's loop would also work. Um, so both uh, are photographed um, in this bottom right photo here. Uh, a ruler can be helpful to, to help understand the scale. Um, flags are really great or, or some kind of marking tape because if you're going out in the field and, uh, and there's an area that you, you want to closely monitor, you can really just you know stake a flag, um, tie some, some marking tape to it, and then you know next time when you come around to scout, you can pay more closely attention to that area. Scouting templates, um, these QR codes will take you to various scouting forms. This is not a comprehensive list of all of the templates out there. Um, so I would encourage you to just get on the internet and, uh, and do some searching. If you're specifically looking for a scouting form for cotton or soybean, it probably exists. Um, fruit, vegetables, um, I think generally, most of the main crops people are growing, uh, there's likely going to be a scouting form for it. 
primarily, I would say, through university extension programs. And then just be aware that there are other pest monitoring tools that you can tap into as a resource. A lot of universities have pest monitoring networks. And so they'll actually set up um, traps with pheromones on, on farms so that they can collect data in real time and then disperse that data, publish it uh, on their website as a report. You can even sign up for text or email alerts. So you might not always have to be doing the scouting yourself. You can tap into some of these other um, university extension, you know, government scouting programs. And then I guess for the last thing I'll share with you is um, on beneficial insect identification. These two are QR codes will um, take you to, well, this first one over here will take you to this natural enemy field guide, which is a great um, one pager with uh, photos and descriptions of a lot of the most common beneficial insects you're gonna see on your farm. Um, I think this is really great to just have as a resource on the farm, you know, in the truck for quick reference. Uh, and then this um, resource on the right is actually like a pocket, um, like handbook size resource that you can carry with you while you're out in the field. Um, it's listed, um, uh, or it's titled Beneficial Insects on New York City Farms. So this resource was created for urban farms, but I guarantee you all of the beneficials in here can be found on rural farms as well, whether they're in New York City or wherever. Um, so this, this resource can certainly be used beyond urban agriculture applications. And so I guess to just wrap things up, um, in summary, uh, effective pest management really requires realistic expectations. Um, those expectations being, again, we are not trying to eliminate every pest from the environment. We want to keep pest populations um, under you know, economically damaging levels, and we use thresholds for pests for disease to help guide that um, decision-making. And uh, scouting is an integral part um, to just the whole equation. Uh, accurate ID is important, not only accurate ID of just of pests, but also of natural enemies. And um, an integrated approach, I would say, is really the best way to tackle um, pest issues on the farm. I really, really strongly encourage you to tap into all of those tools available to you in that IPM toolbox with uh, those chemical controls, of course, being used as a last resort um, only when the others are, are ineffective or, or insufficient. And that is unfortunately all the time I have um, to, to nerd out about this topic with you all. So I um, am happy to take some questions. I think we have perhaps one. How much of drone, okay. Caroline, how much of drone disease monitoring has made its way to the US? I don't know, and that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. If there are others on the call that are more up to date with that, please type in a, a response in the chat. But that's, um, Caroline, that's some of the like high tech scouting and disease monitoring that I would love to get into, but didn't have time to today. That's of course gonna be much more applicable and cost effective for larger farms. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you what the status is um, of that in the US. See another question in the chat, are we able to get a copy of the presentation? Um, so this will be available, um, uh, it's recorded and will be posted on our website and our YouTube page. Justin, do we ever provide a physical, like uh, a PDF of the slides? I'll, that's up to you, Caitlin. If, if you'd like to send them out, the, they can reach out to you through your email there and you can email them the presentation. 
great, perfect. Well then, um, David, I would say plan on that. Yeah, um, feel free to reach out and um, I will include those slides that I didn't have time to, to touch on today. Anything else? No, okay. Well, um, oh, sorry, I see other questions popping in. Do you recommend pit traps and nets? Yes, uh, pitfall traps can be super useful for, for monitoring nets as well. And I, I realized I did not get into sweep netting, but um, sweep netting is definitely a useful monitoring tool. Again, if you're, um, if you're trying to, to monitor fields that are a bit on the larger scale. And okay. All right, I think that's all of the questions that have come in. Okay, folks, well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, if you do have anything else for me, please feel to give me a, a call or an email. Um, happy to dig into this topic with you a bit further. And with that, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and uh, wish you all a fantastic afternoon, wherever you are.